going to post uh, last week's Sunday school lesson, the uh, First Peter chapter three. Uh, Good Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word to guide and direct us. We, we pray for your spirit to lead us through the study of your word. Uh, your spirit to lead us through our our lives as we apply your word to our lives. We pray for those that maybe don't know you as Savior, that your Spirit would draw them, uh, your mercy be upon them, Lord. Uh, Lord, we lift you up as our friend and our Savior, our King of kings, our Lord of lords. And uh, these things we ask in Jesus' name, and only your will be done. Amen. Um, in First uh, Peter 2, it uh, you give us uh, some information on how to deal with uh, different people in our lives. Uh, today we'll, we'll uh, look into the uh, our relationship as husband and wife, and it uh, it starts out with uh, likewise. And there's two likewise in this chapter. Um, one is right it's the very first word, and then a little later on when it it switches over from the wives to the husband as another likewise. So uh, likewise means you know, you're looking back at what was before. So just a, a slight review of a few things in chapter 2 that he's, he's talking about because chapter 3 starts out with likewise. Um, I want to uh, look at verses 11 and 12 out of chapter 2 of First Peter. It says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil, or they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Uh, now there's a goal there in those verses, and uh, your the Gentiles, he says here, are going to see your, your conversation, your conduct. And... Um, then they're going to uh, glorify God in the day of visitation. Um, talking about uh, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. There's, there's the goal in that. Uh, by living out, out their Christian life, they were to be a witness to these people. Then he moves on, you know, that's sort of looking at your fellow man right there, how, how our conduct is to be amongst our fellow man and what the goal is there. Uh, in our Christian walk, we need to, to not lose sight of the goal, and that's how you have to, to deal or how I deal with uh, a lot of aggravating things in life that you run into. Um, people who are um, maybe not good to other people, and you, you may get aggravated with, with that situation, and the way you deal with it is going to affect your Christian witness. Uh, you may be tempted to respond uh, to evil with evil and uh, maybe get revenge or something and maybe it's not for you but it's for someone else and you know, the temptation is to respond in a in a uh, mean way when someone's mean to you or mean to someone uh, that you care about <clears throat> a friend or family and you're you maybe are going to lose your your witness as a Christian by doing so and uh, I'm not I'm not saying that we should uh, turn these criminals, I'm not saying that, or that no one should be arrested for um, doing something bad, I'm not saying that at all, but uh, I'm saying that, that how we respond uh, does affect our, our Christian witness. We need to respond in the right way. Now he moves on to how we, um, how we deal with uh, government and uh, their, their rule over us. Uh, in verse 13, of that second chapter it says submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well so submit yourselves to every ordinance of man um, sometimes we may not like an ordinance uh, that has been uh, you know a law that has been put in place we may not like the fact they put up an extra stop sign somewhere on your route to work or something and then you got to make an extra stop you don't maybe like that or they increased the speed limit or decreased it and uh, you may not like those 
those laws, but as a Christian, we are bound to obey those laws. <clears throat> as Larry Wells, I always go back to his saying, you know, Christians should be a model citizen. And even though you may not agree with them, you need to obey those laws. Uh, that is, and, and he gives the, well, a couple examples here of, of, of the why. He says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, because you are going to represent the Lord. And in verse 15, it says, For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Your witness is going to overcome the foolishness of these people who are who are against God. Um, so in our dealings with our government, you know, we need to obey the laws of the land. Now, sometimes there may be a law that goes against God's law, and so that there we have to obey God rather than man, just like the apostles did back in in Acts. Uh, but you know, an illustration of um, of a law that probably many people didn't like, and if if you're around my age, you'll remember this, but uh, like I said, Aaron may not remember this because he was probably, he may not even been born when this happened. I can't remember just when it did, but a long time ago, they changed Park Avenue to a uh, one-way street. I think Vernon Street was uh, one way going out. Park Avenue is one way coming in. And um, they changed it back, and it, I can't remember if they tried that twice. I, I just can't remember now, but anyway, uh, most people I don't think like that, but we had to obey that law. And uh, one day I w went down through there and uh, turned right on Park Avenue going out of iron in the wrong way, just not meaning to disobey the law, but I did uh, by accident just because I was so used to turning out that way and, and going out of iron on Park Avenue. So here comes a guy down through there, and I realize I've done the wrong thing. He, It's like he floors his car coming right at me, you know. Um, so I, I was I was silly for doing what I did, turning on there the wrong way, and he was kind of silly for coming at me that fast too. But uh, could have been a bad day. But you know uh, that that wasn't on purpose. That was just a human error. But thank God they changed it back to the way it is now. And you know if we'd had it uh, one way from the beginning, uh, and they changed it two way, maybe no one would have liked that. But sometimes change we we go against. But uh, you know, they had to try something to see if it would work, and they did, and I guess it didn't work, so it's, it's back to uh, two-way now. But, uh, I, you know, they, at least they tried something. You know, it didn't work out, but uh, sometimes we got to give people a little bit of leeway to try something because you really don't know if it's going to work or not until you try sometimes. And I, I give them credit for trying. Um, but that, that's just one illustration there of when uh, someone may make a governmental decision that is, is not a, it's not something against God's word, but it's just something we may not like, but we need to obey those laws of the land uh, just to, to keep up our Christian witness because people are expecting that out of us. Um, now he moves on to the, to the work environment. <clears throat> uh, it says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, you know, times in the work environment though know, you may not really uh, really like uh, the way you're treated. And uh, it says here that you know, we need to obey our, our masters. In, in this time, in ser servants here says obey your masters. Back in that day, it was probably talking about slaves, uh, but in our day and time, we will be applying this to to the work environment, uh, employer employee relationship, and uh, you know sometimes you you may have a boss that's maybe not the, the nicest person in the world, but it says here you know you be, be obedient to them just the same as uh, you would someone that, that treats you nice, uh, and he gives the supreme example here. Of the, of the person that did that, and that is Jesus Christ. Uh, in verse 21 it says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his, and follow his steps. And, you know, Christ was 
treated bad here in this life, even though he all he done was was good. <laughs> you know, he, the guy who raised the dead and healed the sick, <clears throat> and uh, you know the, he wasn't treated good, and uh, finally wound up on the cross. And uh, but he you know he laid down his life on the cross, and we know that no one took his life, and and that's a key thing in the our plan of salvation. He did that in his time frame. Uh, but he gives us the example of how, even though he was treated bad, he he treated the people who were around him good, the very ones who prayed for the very ones who nailed him to the cross. Uh, that, that's a tough thing to, um, to follow that example. But that's the example that uh, Peter gives us here. We have the supreme example of Jesus Christ. How that, you know, maybe in this life, you know, the world's not going to treat you good. Uh, so you, you have to realize that, how are you going to respond to that? And you have Christ as the, the supreme example of how to respond to, to evil doers. Um, <clears throat> now, that, that being said, I'm not saying that, we, again, we, that we shouldn't arrest um, criminals and, and put them in jail. That's, you know, that's just part of the, the something that has to happen also. Um, but how we respond to, to people who are not necessarily nice people in our life, and you're going to have them, uh, that is a that is a uh, direct relation to how our Christian witness is going to be viewed by these people. So now we move on to the marriage relationship in in the third chapter of, of uh, First Peter. Let me get my page turned here. Uh, let's read verses 1 and 2, and then I'm going to flip back over to Ephesians chapter 5 and read some, some background for this so that we don't, uh, don't look at this in the wrong context. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, Likewise, ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear and uh, the word conversation of course means conduct so I'm going to flip back over to Ephesians 5 because uh, sometimes men will look at this and all the wife is in subjection to the husband and they um, don't realize the responsibility that God places on the husband the husband has a lot more responsibility in this relationship than than does the wife and we'll see that here as we read uh, Ephesians Chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. I know this is a little bit of reading, but it's important to, to look at, uh, not just look at it one isolated verse out of the Scripture, but see how that applies to the other verses in the Bible. And if you see a conflict with your interpretation of that verse, that it conflicts with another verse in the Bible, you know your interpretation is wrong. It's not the Bible that's wrong. So here we go in Ephesians. It says, Why submit yourselves unto your own husbands? as unto the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, let so the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, the men always like that part, but now we read on to the next. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, <clears throat> that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of, the water, the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth yet even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. For this is, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular love his wife, even as himself, and his wife, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So the, the emphasis here is that the, the man is to take care of his wife. He is to love her as his own flesh, just like Christ loved the church 
and gave himself for it. And the, the church is the body of Christ. And, you know, we become <coughs> excuse me, um, one in Christ. And as uh, the marriage relationship is, the two people become just like they're, they're one person. And I know they're not one person, but it, it's just you care for each other as if you're one. The husband is to care for that wife is just as he would his own body. Love her just like he loves himself and <clears throat> give himself for her as Christ gave himself for the church. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, emphasis here put on the role of the husband in, in his care for his wife. Uh, the wife is told to submit to her husband. It, now that doesn't mean that she's inferior to her husband in any way. That is just... Uh, Submit here is, when I looked it up, is a military term, primarily a military term to rank in, to rank under. It uh, doesn't mean that she is less a person than him. It just means that's her role in, in life. And his, his role in life is to protect and care for his wife. Uh, her role is to reverence her husband. <clears throat> and uh, in, in 1 Peter here, chapter 3, uh, it's talking about the goal of the wife. Uh, sometimes uh, a woman might find herself married to a person who is unsaved for whatever reason. A lot of scenarios in the marriage uh, environment. So that could come about by a lot of reasons. But here is the goal when that, when that happens. When a woman is married to a man who is unsaved. It says, if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation or conduct of the wives. So she is a witness to this unsaved man. Um, and this unsaved man is a person who is not really listening to the Word of God. Maybe he won't go to church. Maybe he won't uh, listen to what she tells him uh, about God, about Jesus Christ being the Savior. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it says, while they behold your chaste conversation, your conduct coupled with fear, uh, that's going to be the witness. It's the life that that, that lady lives out uh, in front of that man. Now, how is she going to do that? Um, this Louis verses 3 and 4 says, Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, a lot of times this, this verse 3 gets taken way out of context. It's, uh, the interpretation is, well, the woman's not to, to plait her hair, or she's not to wear gold, and they leave out the last part, uh, or the putting on of apparel. So if she's not to wear gold or or fix her hair, then uh, it, it also says putting on apparel, so she's not supposed to wear clothes either if you, if you want to take it like some of these people want to interpret this. But when they do that, they're missing the beauty of this, this scripture right here. They're missing the whole point of what God has told us in his word uh, through Peter. Um, <clears throat> if we look at this, the, the word adorning here it is the same word, I'll give you the, the Strong's number, it's 2889. And if you, if you look back at James 4, verse 4, uh, part of that verse says, Who, Whosoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So this same word that is translated world in James 4, 4, Whosoever will be a friend of the world, that same word is 2889. Strong's number, adorning, translated adorning right here. It, it's talking about an arrangement or a decoration. It's the same word uh, that we get uh, cosmetic out of. So it's talking about how, uh, in, in James 4, it's talking about the arrangement of the world, the adorning of the world, the decoration of the world. How is this world decorated? Well, it's decorated in a, <clears throat> in a, a sinful way. It's, um, its goal is, is sin. It's being controlled by, uh, well, it's being controlled by uh, Satan in, a, in the sense that he is influencing people around the world to do some bad things. And we, we see that more and more. Uh, Christian persecution is, is tremendous around the world when you hear some of the news in foreign countries. 
and we see uh, now laws being made that, uh, against the Christian faith in, in our country. Uh, more and more it's leaning towards that way. That's the adorning of the world. The world system is against God. And if you're a friend to that system, you're an enemy of God, it says. Just, just plain and simple. If you're going to be a friend to the world system, the way that the world is adorned in sin and the, and the, the sinful agenda, in other words, then you are not a friend of God. It's just that plain and simple. So how is the woman to be adorned? It says, you know, the, the adorning of fixing her hair and wearing gold and, um, and putting on apparel, nice clothes, uh, what influence is that going to have on her husband for Christ? Well, there's certainly nothing wrong with the wearing of uh, nice clothes, uh, jewelry, fixing her hair, uh, nothing wrong with that. But what influence is that going to have upon her husband? Uh, that's not the thing that's going to change her husband is what the Bible is telling us here. Uh, that's not a bad thing to do. Nothing wrong with that. But what changes her husband? Well, it's, he says it's the hidden man of the heart. Um, you can you may be looked at it in a couple of different ways. I, I thought about uh, you know the hidden person of the heart, your your spirit, the real you. Um, that could be uh, the hidden man of the heart. That's that's the part of us we don't see. You know, we see the the physical part of us, the body, uh, the tangible part. But that spirit part we don't see. But also, uh, the believer is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. In uh, Romans eight fourteen, it says, "For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God." So you might look at the hidden man of the heart the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And you know, the believer also tells us in Romans that if, Romans 8, that if, um, if a person doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So that lady that is led by that Spirit, that's going to show on the outside, not in the, the hair or the gold or uh, the putting on of apparel. Uh, you know, and everyone should dress, you know, decent. I'm not saying... Uh, that we that don't have an influence. I mean, if, if a woman's dressing uh, lewdly, then you know that's going to have an influence on her husband too. But if she's being led by the spirit, she's not going to do that. She's going to she's going to put on the right type of clothes, decent clothes and all. Uh, but the point is, there's a lot of people that maybe are criminals that are, that dress real nice, men and women both maybe. You know, a hit man for the mob might uh, might be wearing a suit and tie, but he'll put a couple of bullets in your head and go home, play with the kids, and eat supper. You know, the, the, there's people that do these things, and it doesn't bother them. It's part of their job. They just don't. It, it doesn't phase them. Um, but they might wear nice clothes. Uh, so the the putting on of apparel is not what's going to change the husband. It's that inward part that's led by the Spirit of God that changes her conduct on the outside and he sees that. He sees there's something different. He's going to know. And people around you know when you're led by the Spirit of God. They know that there's something different about you and they know that uh, it, that it makes them uncomfortable. You've probably been in an environment where you've been in um, in a, a group or around somebody who is into mischief and they know that you're not and they know that you're led by the Spirit of God and they're uncomfortable. And a lot of times it makes us uncomfortable to be around in that environment too because we know that it, we, we know we don't fit in. Uh, you know, we're pilgrims and strangers here in this world and we don't, we don't fit into this, this world system. Uh, that's what we don't fit into. The adornment of this world is the decoration of this world in, in sin. We don't fit into that. And um, her husband is going to be changed by that godly conduct. Uh, I remember, uh, I think, I'm, if I remember the story right, I think it was Charlie Brewer, a friend of mine, told about, and it's, it's kind of a little fuzzy in my mind, but I remember he talked about this godly woman. I think it was his grandma. I have to talk to him again to, to confirm that. but. 
Uh, he never did get to meet her, but he, he always heard how she was such a godly lady, and he's looking forward to meeting her. And uh, her testimony as a godly lady was still living on after she had went home to be with the Lord. And I thought that was such a great thing, that she was <clears throat> adorned with the inner man of the heart, the hidden man of the heart. That, And the Scripture tells us here it's not corruptible. You know, the Holy Spirit is not corruptible. If you have, have the Holy Spirit inside you, guiding you, the Holy Spirit cannot be corrupted. And... Uh, that that is guiding you and just like that lady there her after her decease after she's went home to be with the lord her testimony as living out a godly life is still living on i thought that was that was really great i have to talk to charlie to get the details of that again and confirm everything but i'm pretty sure it was his grandma uh, so what does god think about this lady says in, in um, <clears throat> let me find the verse here. Um, in verse 4, it says, um, let me find where I want to start. I'll read the whole verse. Uh, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, that's how she's adorned, in, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So this lady that's living out her godly life, even though her husband may not treat her exactly right, I'm not saying you should stay in an uh, abusive environment either, but I'm just, I'm just saying that uh, maybe he's not listening to the preaching. He's not going to church with her. He may not be the nicest person. Sometimes people get under conviction, they get a little irritable, uh, maybe a lot irritable. And... Uh, but she's living out a godly life in front of this fella. And God says that in his eyes, in his sight, this is of great price. So she's a valuable lady to God, what she's doing. Now he gives an example here in verses 5 and 6 of, of uh, way back in Abraham's time, or Abraham's wife Sarah. And, you know, Abraham was uh, the father of the Jewish nation, and he... Um, He's one of their heroes, a big hero of them. For after this manner in the old time, the holy, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husband. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Um, I think Aaron read that verse to Dusty, just teasing with her how... Sarah called Abraham Lord. <laughs> he wanted to tease her a little bit about that. So uh, here's we come into verse 7 now. <clears throat> After seeing this example of a, a lady who lived many years before Peter wrote this, uh, we come to the husbands, another likewise in verse 7. Let's read that. It says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Uh, this word knowledge here, as I looked it up, says seeking to know. Uh, you're, you're seeking to understand your wife. And I think as Adrian Rogers said, you tell me if a man says that he understands women, he says, I'll show you a guy to lie about just about anything. Uh, so men do have a hard time relating to women, I think, sometimes. We, are, we think different. It says giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of, of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Um, so it, when it says the weaker vessel, does that mean inferior? <clears throat> I want to look a little closer to that. <clears throat> closer to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but the husband has to seek to understand his wife, has to, to live with her, uh, like he's got some sense. Use some sense. Uh, try to understand your wife. Tish tells me all the time, after all these years, I still don't understand her. And uh, men and women just think different. Uh, it's Men tend to look at just a problem as solving the problem. They don't look at the emotional part of it. Sometimes women like to be consoled w within the problem, you know, in the 
process of solving the problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, women tend to <clears throat> throw some emotion into their, their thinking more so than men. <clears throat> Excuse me. They throw the emotional um, part in, into solving a problem or dealing with the situation more so than men. Men will just look at it, well, it's a problem to solve and you, you, you got to fix it. <clears throat> Uh, I was talking on Sunday about, uh, I've told this before, but uh, years years and years ago, Tish and I were still young and uh, driving down the road and I, I let the car get low on gas and uh, she's afraid it's going to run out of gas and I wasn't real positive we weren't, but I, I figured, you know, we, we would make it maybe. And uh, I had a banana there and I started eating a banana and she's, she starts fretting and says, you know, here we're about out of gas and you're eating a banana. You know, my thinking was, hey, if I'm going to run out of gas, I'm going to run out of gas. But if I don't eat this banana, I'm going to be hungry and out of gas. So I eat a banana, I'll, at least I've solved one of those problems. You know, um, <clears throat> I tend to look at things <clears throat> a little different. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. A little differently. And, and I've noticed that even in Marley. Um, <clears throat> we play, and sometimes I'll be the, the big bad wolf. And I told her, I said, well, if, if you give me a hug, I won't be a big bad wolf anymore. I'll be a good wolf. Well, she comes over and gives me a hug, you know, like she puts the emotional part of it in there. And, uh, you know, the boys may not have fell for that. They and I thought, well, no, that's just a trick. You're, you're, you're just luring me in to, to eat me. And, uh, you know, but she come over and give me a hug. And uh, I, I don't know if the boys would have done that or not, but the, the emotional part that even, you know, I see in her, Kind of amazing how, how different uh, little girls and boys are in in the, their thought train. You know, she's she's pretty uh, articulate too. What well, says here? Giving honor. Uh, honor could mean value. Uh, you have an honor to the wife uh, of the wife of your wife as the weaker vessel. So does weaker mean inferior? We come to that point. Uh, I thought of an illustration years ago when I was young. <clears throat> I was a real small boy, and uh, of course I didn't understand everything going on here, but uh, we only raised one hog when I was growing up. And uh, it was kept up my Grandpa Abner's uh, place, had a hog pen across the road uh, from his house there. And I can't remember going up there a lot, but I remember going up there. And... Uh, th the old hog was named Susie, and uh, eventually, you know, she was butchered. I wasn't around when they killed her and done all that, but you know, I, I knew I knew what happened to her. But anyway, we raised that hog, and uh, I, I really didn't have any hand in raising her. But you know, Dad and Grandpa, then they, they they did the work. Uh, but anyway, when you feed a hog, you, you uh, what do you use? You go get. Uh, a bucket. You're going to take the slop to the hog, uh, the, and so you, you you get the scraps and all, and they're in an old bucket, and you dump them in the the hog trough. <clears throat> That's what you use. Well, if if you um, if you're going to entertain a, a friend, you got someone coming over that maybe ain't seen them in a long time. Maybe it's a friend, a family member, uh, someone that that you want to show respect to and, and let them know that, that you really care about them. So what are you going to do? You're going <clears> to <throat> get out your best dishes, your fine china, I guess you call it. Um, we eat out of our fine china every day. Uh, that's all we got. And we, we don't actually have any fine china. <laughs> it's just whatever, you know. Um, we don't have any dishes like that. But <clears throat> if you did, that's what you would get out, wouldn't you? you get out the the special dishes, the the dishes that are, are reserved for uh, an occasion like that, that's where you want to honor someone or show them a nice time, show them that you care about them. Uh, well, the men are kind of like that, you know, that bucket. It's strong enough to, to hold the, the slop for the hog. Uh, but you wouldn't want to feed the hog out of your fine dishes. If you had the fine china, you wouldn't want to take that out and, and slop the hog with that. Well, one thing, it's the fine china is delicate. It could break easily. Uh, it it wouldn't be strong enough to hold all that slop for the hog, would it? Uh, so 
there's two different two different uses here. Uh, the, the slop bucket for the hog is not <clears throat> is, is not something you want to feed your friend out of, uh, but it's it's great for the hog. It's great for taking the scraps to the hog, but the fine china is not. Uh, so each one fulfills their purpose perfectly. Uh, and that's the way it is with men and women. Men and women are different. They like to say that we're not, but they, they are. Um, one uh, little little joke I heard one time, a friend told me, and I, I can't get it exactly like he told it, but um, like is the illustration like God was, uh, and, and a man was having a conversation, and the man asked God, says, well, God, why did you make uh, the woman so, so pretty and soft? And God says, well, I made her that way so you would like her. And the man, uh, of course, us men always like to think we're smarter than our, our wives. Uh, the wives know better, but they let us think that anyway. But um, the man says, "Well, why didn't you make her smarter?" Uh, and God tells him, "says Well, I didn't make her any smarter so that she would like you." And uh, you know, men and women are just different. They think different. Um, men don't necessarily always use the emotional part of their their mind to solve a problem. And um, women do, and that adds an element to the home that a man just can't put in there. And God made us different so that when we come together, as, as Aaron was talking, him and Dusty, as they come together, you know, she, she adds to the family what he can't, and he adds to the family what she can't. And you come together, and God has made us that way to be a family, to be a unit, and uh, it works. Um, <clears throat> you know, a woman will never make a good man. A man will never make a good woman. I know in today's society they're trying to mix us all up, but um, I've always said I've never seen a man that I thought would make a good wife. And, you know, there's fine men out there, upstand, outstanding citizens, and um, maybe handsome, uh, nice people, but I've never seen one I thought would make a good wife. Uh, that's just the way it is with me. I'm still old school. I'm uh, happy with the wife I've got, and uh, I don't think any man's going to replace her or any woman either. Uh, she's been very good to me over the years, so <clears throat> I'm tickled to death we got together. But one is not better than the other, and uh, God made us different. You know, it, in Christ, it, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. You're you're a person to God. Uh, all lives matter to God. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. You've you've been created for two different roles in life, and that's what we got to understand. And uh, the, the the wife, just because she's told to submit to her husband, doesn't mean that her husband is supposed to be uh, just some kind of a, a a boss over her. That's that's mean. You know, it says as Christ loved the church, and Christ always makes the best choices for the church. Uh, everything he does is for the church's benefit. Uh, and that's the way a husband and wife relationship is supposed to be. The husband has got a lot of responsibility to his wife. The wife is to reverence her husband and submit to her husband. That's, that's what the scripture tells us. And uh, one is not better than the other, though. That doesn't mean that the, the wife is less, just because it says she's the, the weaker vessel. Uh, we know that strength wise, most of the time men are. are stronger than a woman with the same weight. Uh, I'm sure there's some women that could take me out, don't, don't get me wrong, but uh, in general, you know, that's the way it is. That's the way we're created. Nowadays, you know, they want to have um, men compete in women's sports and, you know, stuff that we just didn't do in the past. And it's, it's just obvious why we didn't do it. You didn't, but now they're they're doing some crazy stuff in, in the world. Uh, I don't know what's uh, what well I know what brought on all this Satan's uh, influence on people uh, that's what's brought it all on and, and we, as we see these things coming into play we know that the time of Christ coming back is getting sooner and sooner uh, so uh, we just have to, to hold on to that promise that he's coming back and this foolishness will be ended now something it tells us too um, he says in verse 7, Likewise, husbands, dwell with your 
will dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Uh, if our marriage relationship is is um, bad, then it says it can hinder our prayers. You know, we don't have a right relationship between husband and wife, then it can hinder our prayers because, quite frankly, there's there's sin involved if, if we're not getting along right. I'm not treating her right or she's not treating me right. And, uh, most likely it's going to be me. I'm going to be the one at fault. But anyway, uh, that's what he's telling us. When, when you don't have that relationship right, there's, there's something wrong. There's, there's going to be sin involved somehow. And <clears throat> that's going to hinder your prayers. Um, there's no closer relationship than the husband and wife relationship. And that's what's used to illustrate Christ's relationship to the church. Well, let's look at uh, verse 8 now. It says, it, it moves from the husband and wife relationship to how we deal with, with other believers. He says, Finally be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful and courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrariwise, blessing, knowing that ye are, that ye are thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. Um, now it goes on in, in verse 12, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto the prayers, their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, in the church, you know, you're not always going to get along. We should. We should be, we should always get along. But, you know, I've, I've been in church a lot of years, and I realize that uh, we'll get on each other's nerves. If you're around me long enough, and, and if I don't get on your nerves, you're a very patient person. Uh, but that's that's just the way it is in life. And if we love each other like we should, uh, you know, I've seen uh, years and years go by at the church. We maybe didn't always agree, but we always stayed together because we loved each other and we loved the Lord. And <clears throat> we just put up with each other. And uh, sometimes that's the way it is in a husband-wife relationship. Uh, if you don't get on each other's nerves, uh, you're really good people. Uh, but you, you probably will, but you stay together because you love each other. And that's the way it is. You You learn to put up with each other because there will be maybe little irritating things that you, you do to each other. Uh, it's just it's just part of life, but that's part of getting along. You you kind of put up with each other, and uh, you don't you don't render evil for evil. Uh, just because you get a little irritated, you don't you don't get uh, render evil to the other person. It says in verse nine, not rending evil for evil or railing for railing. But contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. If if people would realize that maybe sometimes someone's having a bad day, they just get a little out of sorts, and instead of coming back with evil, would respond in a, a little different way and try to realize that maybe maybe just something's wrong in their life. Something's happened that's really got them upset and not come back with a, a mean response, there'll be a lot, of, lot less arguments, a lot less divorces. Uh, let's move on to verses 13 through 16. <clears throat> and who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? And, uh, but and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid, of their terror, neither be troubled. Now, it it doesn't <laughs> sounds kind of counterintuitive when he says, but but and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you. That when you're suffering, it don't sound like you're going to be happy. But you can be glad knowing that what happened to you, the suffering you might go through, is you've done the right thing. If if you've done the right thing and you suffer for it, you can be happy knowing that you've done the right thing, regardless of what the other person does. You know that you've done the right thing, and you can rejoice in that. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason 
with the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed, yet falsely accuse your, your conversation in Christ. More and more Christians are said to be haters, you know, because we don't go along with the agenda of the world. Uh, we are more and more looked down upon by, by the world because the world is getting darker. And that's what's going to happen. You're just going to have to put up with it. Um, but it says here to, to always be ready to give an answer. And, you know, answers in Genesis, that was one of their uh, verses they liked really well, to always be able to give an answer. And that was part of their, part of their program there, was to, to be able to give an answer. And uh, I, like, I like the Creation Museum. I like to go back down and see the, the ark exhibit. I haven't been down there in a lot of years. Look at verse... 18 through 22 it says for Christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit by which also he went and preached into the spirits in prison which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing a uh, preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism, does now also save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of, of a good conscience toward God by the conversation of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Well, Christ is our supreme example of someone who suffered unjustly, and he's giving us the, the example that that's going to happen to us as a born-again believer. Not everyone's going to like you, but be ready to give an answer to every man to ask. Um, and as we come to uh, verse 19, I, I asked the church this Sunday um, for opinions on this. They might want to think about this. Um, uh, there's different opinions on, on this scripture. Uh, 19 and 20 says, By which also he went and preached into the, unto the spirits in prison. Now, who are those spirits in prison? Some think it's fallen angels. Some think it was the people in those days that rejected the message and then Christ showed them um, in Hades or Sheol uh, that uh, the preaching of Noah was true. Um, I think J. Vern McGee, if I remember right, you, you have to check me on this, but I think his explanation was that it was the preaching of Noah through the Holy, the guiding of the Holy Spirit that he's talking about here, and when that happened was during the preaching that Noah did before the, the flood. So different interpretations on this, and I, I'm going to say this is a tough scripture to to, to pinpoint. I can't really pinpoint it. Uh, you may have a opinion on. It. I would um, uh, I would advise to to look at some different opinions and see what you think. Um, you see what you think on this, because there's some different interpretations on this. Um, but I'm going to say I, I don't know exactly what happened there. Uh, uh, I looked at uh, John MacArthur's opinion, J. Vern McGee. I think I looked in some of the study Bibles I have. Um, so th there's there's different opinions, but we just know that uh, he preached to the, the spirits in prison. Uh, and he refers back to the time of Noah. Um, the uh, the baptism of water, we I think everyone understands that that does not not save you, but it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that actually saves you. Uh, I believe in baptism of water. I'm, I've been baptized, and uh, I firmly believe in that, that. That that's a good thing to do. That that shows that you have made a commitment to Christ, that you have accepted Him as your Savior. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when God's Holy Spirit comes and lives within you, uh, that, that is the, the thing that saves you. And it tells us in verse 22 where Christ is, is at, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Now, that's where he's at right now. But what I'd like to tell everyone right now as we close out here is that He's there now, but he is coming back. And the important thing is that 
uh, you know him as your Savior. And if you don't, realize that he's not going to be at the right hand of the Father all the time. There's going to be a time when he leaves the right hand of the Father, he comes back to get the church. And uh, his death, burial, and resurrection, and you put your faith and trust in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's what God required for the payment of sin. God paid the debt of sin. You don't have to pay it. You can't pay it. It's paid for you. It's it's handed to you free. Service, you know, to serve God requires a, a sacrifice. But the salvation part of it is totally free. Um, service doesn't have anything to do with you being saved. Being You keep kept saved. Some people think, well, I'm kept by my works. No, you're not. Uh, you're saved. Salvation is totally by grace. God gives it as a gift, and uh, I would urge anyone to get ready right now. You don't, you know, you don't have a promise of the next heartbeat even. Uh, I don't either, and but I'm ready to go if he comes back right now, or if I, this is my last time my heart ticks, and before I can close this out, I'm, I'm gone, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm in the hands of God because of what Christ did, not because of anything I've done or not done. It's all because of what he's done for me. Um, I see uh, Brenda on here, and um, I think she might remember Mr. Sert. I never did meet him, uh, but they said he used to testify, it's not what I've done, but it's what he's done for me that counts, and that's true. And uh, if you accept him as your Savior, let us know. See uh, Jerry, Jerry Wiley there, uh, good, uh, good to see you, Jerry, and I hope, I appreciate everyone watching. and. Um, hope everyone has a good day. Like I say, get us word if you accept Christ your Savior. And uh, Lord willing, maybe we can do this next week.